This is Under the Crossed Swords, a podcast series from Mosquito Nautica. This episode's biography is Sergeant Roy Chilton, Marine Engineer. It covers his time in Borneo, Egypt and Scotland and several other events that he witnessed and was part of. I've pronounced one of the port names in Egypt incorrectly. I say Port Said when I really mean Port Said, but I didn't fancy going and re-recording the whole biography again, so please accept this correction. Hope you enjoy, and here it is. Recollections of my Army Service in the Royal Army Service Corps Water Transport by R.C. Shelton I thoroughly enjoyed my Marine Engineering 3 course of 8 weeks duration which consisted of working on various boats and types of engines and included a memorable day or so on the upper reaches of the River Yar learning how to scull, row and deal with a very ancient outboard motor. I then joined the Dickens class, General Service Launch, or GSL, Sykes, as engineer. This was only for six months, but a very eventful time it turned out to be. My skipper was Corporal Webb, ex-Navy, a very patient and knowledgeable navigator, who was eventually commissioned, becoming a skipper of a tank landing craft, or LCT. He subsequently joined the civilian fleet as a captain on their LCT Mark 8s. Our moorings were on a trot in Yarmouth Harbour. Setting out one morning, we came around the top trot to find ourselves head-to-head with one of our harbour launches. Telegraphed to full astern, we beat a quick retreat. All I could see from the engine room was a pair of fast-moving, agitated legs heading for the wheelhouse. The telegraph shot to full ahead. I learned afterwards that this was to avoid crushing a civilian dinghy, which we proceeded to sink anyway with our propeller wash. By then we were moving ahead at quite a speed, so much so that even with the wheel hard a port, we more than glanced off the top trot pile. We were at least now pointing towards the harbour entrance. This collision with the pile sending us careering across the trot to collide with a very expensive white painted cruiser. I can personally vouch for what happened next. There are three portholes in the engine room of a GSL. In the first port there appeared an upright ship's boarding ladder. In the second port it appeared at a 45 degree angle. In the third port appeared nothing. I understand that the accident report, normally reserved for motor vehicle accidents, caused quite a stir and was subsequently framed and posted up in the flotilla office. Such is the price of fame. My saga on the Sykes still has a story to tell. This would not be complete without me mentioning the Warrant Officer First Class, Gardner, who was in charge of the flotilla at Fort Victoria. He was very popular and was always referred to as R or Ra Gardner this being his means of curing his really bad stutter gained from an incident in the war. He was skipper of an MFV which refuelled with an incorrect type of fuel. The vessel subsequently blew up, killing his engineer, hence his stutter. One Saturday, we were ordered to Portsmouth to tow back one of our vessels that had broken down. I was not at all keen on this, as the weather was blowing up and I had a dodgy engine. Nevertheless, off we went. Entry into Portsmouth Harbour was worrying with a heavy swell up our stern. We duly picked up a foresaid vessel and its crew who were dead keen to get back for the weekend. So off we went, pitching into the sea and wind. Sure enough, my dodgy starboard engine packed up. The subsequent slowing caused the tow rope to slacken 
This immediately wound itself around the port propeller, leaving two RAS sea vessels floundering off South Sea. In the shallow water, the anchor we put out was dragging and the shore was definitely approaching. It was getting on for nightfall and our distress signals did not appear to be getting any answers. Then miraculously, the only vessel that could have reached us in such shallow water appeared. A naval paddle steamer tug, which proceeded to pull both boats back into the harbour. Next morning, the MFV 1502 appeared, and so it was that three RASC vessels left Pompey. Upon our less than triumphant return to Fort Victoria, we were greeted by R.O. R.R. R. Gardner, waving a newspaper. He greeted us with the words, R.O. R. Shilton, I don't have to ask you what the... <clears throat> You've been up to now. It had made the front page of the local paper. The only good thing, as Gardner pointed out, was that the report said that it was three RAF boats. Anyway, enough of my time on Sykes. I was then placed as second engineer on the MFV 1502, where I spent a very happy 15 months. This included the memorable Copenhagen trip with 10 water transport vessels calling into various countries and ports along the North Sea coast. Organised by a Major Spencer, bucking for his promotions colonel, which he did get. He thoroughly deserved it because the whole flag-waving trip was well organised. We all had new tailored battle dress. The boats were well prepared, even down to my vessel, the MFE 1502, later called the Yarmouth Navigator, being dry docked in the floating dock at Sheerness. This was a strange but worthwhile experience. All in all, boats and men looked the cat's whiskers. Here again my warped sense of humour allows me to remember that Major Spicer was very conscious of image. Consequently, every port we put into, he laid on a troop inspection for any local dignitary. Ostend Docks became a location for the full works. Open order, armed salute, and his troops immaculately dressed in every sense. As this dignitary began his inspection of the front rank, a woman with a large squeaky pram and three wailing children wandered through and along the rear rank, the best laid plans, etc. Christmas of 1951 found me following Biff Fricket to Egypt, flying on one of the first troop carrying aircraft with a civilian firm called Airworks. The army was obviously still finding its way with the changeover from troop ships to aircraft because we found ourselves lodged in London in a disused underground station close to Gooch Street. One thing I clearly remember is that it was a bloody long way down with full kit. It was also strange to be bunking in the tunnel with the trains only a few feet away. Flying from Blackbush, they operated Avro Yorks. These were four-engine planes virtually discarded after the war. These planes were unpressurised and had a low ceiling height, a speed barely over 200 miles per hour, and they found it hard work getting over the Alps. We flew so low that we could clearly see church spires and house roofs peeping up from the clouds. Coming into Malta on a low approach, it was possible to see an RAF chap leaning against a fence, furthering good relations with one of the local girls. Delayed in Malta while one of the engines was changed, I had a chance to visit Valletta, still being repaired from war bomb damage. 24 hours later saw my first night in Egypt. This was in a tented transit camp. As far as I was concerned, this was definitely in the desert, and this short stay cemented my opinion of the country. The latrines were even further out over the sands, a four foot high Hessian fence leaving one in almost full view squatting on a 20 holer mounted over a deep pit. The flies and smell formed a lasting impression. Next day we trucked to Port Said, where I joined 48 Company Water Transport. A few nights in tents before being sent to number one island in the harbour. This was where our then owned RESC workshops and boats were tied up. Conditions here were even more primitive with washing facilities almost non-existent. 
My first boat was an XRAF twin-engine seaplane tender called Grey Mist. My first job was to top overhaul both the Perkins engines. This was so successful that we positively flew over Port Said Harbour, the fastest she had ever been according to our naval coxswain, who was on loan from HMS Belfast, then guard ship at the Suez Canal entrance. My stay at Port Said was short, and apart from the constant night guard duties, entirely unremarkable, save for the fact that this was classed as active service, and due to the troubles caused by Colonel Nasser, we were armed with 50 rounds of live ammunition. One night, while I was on guard duty on Grey Mist, a bullet whistled across us. As it was dark, I had no hope of spotting from whence it came, so with no chance of returning fire, I did the only sensible thing and took cover between the two engines. No further bullets came. We will never know who fired that shot or why. It could have been a terrorist, or, as we were inclined to believe, a bored British sentry on the shore. In February, I was put aboard the fast launch Karen. This, a 45-foot river-class vessel, was to be my charge for the next two and a half years. We were immediately sent down the canal en route for Adabaya, an army port in the Red Sea. This was in convoy with another fast launch, coxswained by Sergeant Biff Fricker, his engineer being his brother Mick, who was a great friend of mine, being an ex-army apprentice like myself. Shortly after setting off, we lost contact with the other fast launch, due to the fact that we broke down and it took me two hours to fix it. Starting off again, we passed a northbound convoy, in those days largely comprising British merchantmen. They were all flying their colours at half-mast. We were roundly ticked off by the second vessel, and from the third we learnt that King George VI had just died. We were without wireless and had left Port Said very early that morning, hence our failure to correctly display our ensign. This and the engine delay caused us to berth overnight at another army port at Fanara on the Great Bitter Lake. This later turned out to be our long-term placement. The next day we departed down the canal to Port Tufik and out onto the Red Sea and Adabaya, an army port run by the Royal Engineers. We were rejoined by Sergeant Fricker and Mick. Both fast launches were being used to take personnel out to various troop ships, then still in use, not yet fully replaced by trooping by air. Before long, the fast launch Karen was ordered back up the canal to Fanara Wharf, where I spent the next very busy 20 months. Fanara was the main British Army supply wharf, with RE barges constantly unloading supplies from merchant ships. Mick mentions that we were both short of personnel, as indeed we were, in spite of 90,000 service personnel in the Middle East land forces at the time. Maintenance of our fast launch took up a large part of our time. This is because it was greatly used by high-ranking officers using it as a staff car. It was, however, the guard duties that almost brought us to our knees, with six out of seven nights being on guard or standby. The guards' regiment relieved us. This left us free to spend our weekends taking various troops on recreational trips to the Blue Lagoon situated on the Sinai Desert side. Unfailingly, then, a weekend would be taken up with yacht club details bringing becalmed officers' yachts back until 9pm. Close to rebelling, I was granted R&R &R leave to Cyprus. This was a marvellous experience and restored my sanity. In mentioning guard duties, I recall one young National Serviceman coming back from his first stag duty, approaching me with the words, Corporal, what is the point of carrying 50 of these dummy rounds? I could see that he was in earnest, and as a young corporal, I was not quite sure what to do. In the event, I thought the safest thing to do was to send him out on his next stag, unarmed. It was then I realised that the training we as regulars were giving national servicemen was not all it should be. My opinion from that point on was that as 25% of the army was devoted to training national service personnel, the sooner it was disbanded, the better. 
This was finally realised in 1960, and I honestly believe that the army improved almost overnight. I returned to the UK in June 54 to sit my Marine Engineering 1 course. Vitally important to me to ensure further promotion. To get flown home in time, I had to see the Colonel with a redress of grievance claim. It overruled my OC's decision, which was to refuse my request. Much relieved, I was flown back six months before my tour was due to finish. I was therefore very surprised to be told by the OC at Golden Hill Fort that I would not be returning to Egypt. To this day, I feel that he was secretly delighted at the subsequent discomfort of his counterpart in Port Zed. Having passed my ME1, I became engineer on the 60-foot MFV-160, later called the Yarmouth Seaman. This was an interesting placement from an engineer's point of view, with its rather old-fashioned Widdup two-stroke direct reversing engine, the workings of which I will not try to explain here. Following this, I became an instructor at Fort Victoria, a job I thoroughly enjoyed. This was interspersed with military duties, one of which was the 1955 Remembrance Day Parade. This being ten years since the end of the war was of particular note, a service and full parade being arranged at Tottenham Church. The Water Transport Company was to lead, followed by the British Legion, the Fire Brigade and numerous other bodies. These definitely included the Totland Brownies. A promise of the core band did not materialise much to our disappointment. Nothing daunted, the OC laid on a civilian loudspeaker van. This was duly issued with a record of Jump on the Wagon, our core march, usually quite a jaunty tune. I should point out to any reader who has had the patience to read this far that the army has various rates of march. The guards strike a very leisurely 110 steps to the minute. The majority of regiments march at 120, this includes the RASC. Then there are the light infantry with an astounding 140 steps per minute. Come the day, off we set from fresh water. Initially the route was flat, the loudspeaker van delivering the set pace, 120 paces per minute. At the first slope the van's batteries could not cope and we slowed to below guards rate. It is not easy to march with pipes music going through the entire British Army's rate of march. Arriving at the church we found that only half the parade was still with us. The brownies who had been last in the order arrived eventually. After the service it became obvious that a decision had to be made. The civilian van was banished, and the Totland Brownie pack was to march immediately behind us. Arriving successfully back at Freshwater, a distance of two miles, the Brownies were still firmly attached. As parties dismissed, we started for our barracks. The OC ordered, march at ease, and he was therefore able to look back. I shall never forget his look of consternation when he realised that these Brownies are still with us. March to attention, came the order. Still they stuck with us. Smarten the pace, Sergeant Major, shouted the OC. The rate must have approached light infantry speed, and they still stuck with us, their pigtails flying, their red-faced portly leader resolutely urging them on. Eventually they relented, and thankfully wheeled off on their way back to Totland. The whole episode obviously marked us all, I remember the Remembrance Day for all the wrong reasons, and I feel sure the OC, who shortly after retired from the service, was a beaten man. Promoted to Sergeant in late 1957. I was immediately posted to LCT 4041 as second engineer. The subsequent 20 months allowed me to fully understand the layout and mechanics of the wretched things. Scotland and trips to St Kilda, the Army Rocket Tracking Station, very quickly began to pale, so for the first time ever I applied for a worldwide posting. What did I get but Scotland? This time as a PSI, Permanent Staff Instructor, with the Water Transport TA at air. I thoroughly enjoyed my 14 months with them before they disbanded. Alec Hastings, Navigator, and myself took the GSL back to Bangor 
by the Isle of Man and the Menai Straits, a very interesting trip. The disbandment was a great pity because once again it had involved the small boats that I felt comfortable with. My time with the TA included a summer camp back at Freshwater. This was followed by a GSL through the Clyde and Forth Canal to Edinburgh and onto the River Dee estuary. Mooring one's boat in the middle of Glasgow, Mary Hill to be exact, was odd to say the least. 1961 saw me once again back at Golden Hill as an instructor. During this period, all the static engines were transferred to St George's Barracks at Gosport. There I and a team of trainees, including two from Fiji, installed and ran them up prior to close down of the training company at Golden Hill. Unlike Mick, who spent a lot of time abroad, I was involved with trading until Christmas 1965. January saw me posted to Borneo, Sarawak, via Singapore. This Borneo posting was due to the confrontation with Indonesia. They already occupied one half of the island and wanted to annex the other half. The water transport company had a small detachment of two river class fast launches stationed at Cebu, an island port. We carried out river patrol duties. This was enjoyable, back to my small boats, and fascinating as it entailed calling in at various remote villages. Our patrols meant four days out and three days back at Cebu. Rivers in Sarawak being the equivalent of roads in any other country meant being extremely busy visiting suspect villages sympathetic to Indonesia. With two fast launches, the patrol area was constantly covered, as one returned so the other had already set out, both vessels being absolutely identical and always visible to passing passenger and cargo boats plying the rivers. We got the reputation for being a lot faster than we really were. We furthered this supposed speed by using our comparatively shallow draft to cross sandbanks between rivers thus saving perhaps 15 miles of river work. We managed this by the entire crew, including the interpreter and apart from the coxswain, jumping into the water, thus lightening the boat. Then we lifted the fast launch up over the bank with the engines going slow ahead. This worked on several occasions, although I did worry about water snakes. The locals were obviously so impressed with this false show of speed that they started to build a similar hard chine vessel for passenger work. It was doomed to fail as it only had one engine and therefore had no chance of ever getting on the plane which allowed a fast launch when in prime condition to reach close to its design speed of 18 knots. This unattached posting was meant to be for a year but as the troubles finished in August the fast launches were returned to Singapore as deck cargo aboard the Sir Lancelot. Having been promoted to Warren's Officer 2nd Class, 1966-1968, to saw me as Chief Engineer on an LCT Mark VIII, name forgotten. The only memorable thing, apart from a trip to Brunei and Bangkok, was the snapping of the propeller shaft. This presented no problem, as all LCTs carried a spare mounted in the tank deck. This happening must have caused quite a stir in UK supply circles, of which more later. Posted back to the UK in 1968 and after a great leave involving small ex-ships lifeboats in Shellfleet Creek, I was sent to Marchwood, now the UK LCT base, as liaison engineer to the REME workshops. This was such a non-event that there was very little for me to do. The REME having having usurped our workshops in 1952, were now firmly in control with civilian staff assisting them. I therefore couldn't believe my luck when in 1969 I was promoted to Warrant Officer First Class. Although qualified for this rank since 1954, there were just no vacancies, there only being two Warrant Officer placements worldwide at this time. With ever-dwindling numbers and postings for small boats, even this establishment was reduced to one. Although I thoroughly disliked serving on LCTs, it was thanks to them that all chief engineers were of warrant rank. Indeed, almost surfeit of them, hence my posting to Marchwood. 
Following this, a chance to return to trading at St George's Barracks presented itself. Naturally, I leapt at the opportunity. Unfortunately, I made such a pig's ear of this, which I won't enlarge upon, that I was posted to Bahrain as chief on the LCT Arezzo. This again was an unaccompanied posting of six months rotation. This again left us very little to do. The British naval influence was coming to an end. The Navy, who we were billeted with, had a few minesweepers and a contingent of marine commandos. These were on one occasion involved in Oman on some hush-hush enterprise, which they refused to discuss. Subsequently, we heard via unconfirmed reports that a fair number of wounded were rushed home via the airport. We did a small landing exercise involving the Trucial Oman scouts before visiting Abu Dhabi and down through the Straits of Hormus. We did a small landing exercise involving the Trucial Oman scouts before visiting Abu Dhabi and down through the Straits of Hormus then back up to Kuwait on a final flag-waving exercise before the Navy handed over the base to the US 6th Fleet. Our six months posting ended with Arezzo being sold, lock stock, but less the propeller shaft, to two Lebanese businessmen. They tried very hard to recruit the Warrant Officer First Navigator, a Colin McCluskey, and myself to stay as crew for the LCT. We both declined, although we only had six months still to serve. Although I hadn't a clue what I was going to do in Civvy Street, I gratefully declined any more LCT duties. Just before Christmas 1971, my tour having finished, I returned to the UK and finished my 25 years in June 1972. Conclusions I was extremely fortunate in my 22 years service in the RESC. Lucky first in my choice of the Water Transport Division. This stemmed from my father, also in the RESC, showing me around at the age of 13 several of the Corps boats in Gibraltar. Lucky in as much that nine years of my service was on or with small boats of the RESC fleet. Also lucky with the advent of the Corps taking over from the Navy the LCT Mark 8s. Although I hated serving on these craft, their presence enabled me to reach warrant rank. Again, I was lucky serving only five years on the wretched things, the remainder of my service time being involved with the training of marine engineers. Not only lucky, but I had a very enjoyable time in the water transport. You've been listening to the memoirs of Sergeant Roy Shilton. Please visit the Mosquito Nautica Facebook, Twitter or Instagram pages for photos and links to more information and additional material. This is all very new and still growing, so any feedback or questions are more than welcome. Thanks for listening, and please subscribe so you don't miss out on hearing more stories from the men who served under the crossed swords.